Britain's fight to repossess the Falkland Islands was the country's biggest and bloodiest military operation since the Second World War. What follows is a pictorial record of that campaign, and it contains scenes that some people will find distressing. But war can also bring out a special kind of comradeship, and there's plenty of that in the story too. Disputes between Britain and Argentina over islands in the South Atlantic go back 150 years at least, to the 1830s, when Britain first decided to settle there. Arguments about sovereignty have been continuous ever since, and at the beginning of April 1982, Argentine forces did what they'd been threatening to do for years. They've got as well and truly pinned down, and that they're not trying to attack, so I think they're waiting for the armoured personnel vehicles to come. And, uh, and then I think maybe they'll have another go. The voice of the governor of the Falklands, talking live from Government House on the island's radio, as Argentine troops moved into Port Stanley. It was early in the morning of April the 2nd. Virtually the whole population was listening. How long do you think you can hold out, sir? I do, but I mean, if they, they've got 30 millimetre cannon on the armoured personnel carriers, so uh, one or two shots of them and we'd be finished, I'm afraid. Yes, sir. Uh, but uh, I, I'm um, hopeful that they'll, they'll uh, ask for, they'll send somebody in to talk. And you'll talk to them, will you, sir? I'll talk to them, but I'm not walking out. I'm not surrendering to the bloody arches, um, uh, Patrick, certainly not. But despite the governor's defiant stance, within just a few hours of the landing, the Argentine flag was flying in the grounds of Government House. There had been a brief skirmish with the 64 British Marines defending the islands. One Argentine armoured personnel carrier was knocked out and several of their men killed. But outnumbered by more than 10 to 1, there was little the Marines could do. As soon as news of the invasion reached Buenos Aires, the outburst of patriotism verged on hysteria. From childhood, every Argentine is taught that Islas Malvinas, as they call the Falklands, belong to them. Taking them over, and two days later, South Georgia, was a hugely popular move guaranteed to keep people's minds off less palatable facts like Argentina's massive inflation rate or the widespread political repression. The man who had most to gain from the distractions of a successful Falklands invasion was the president, Leopoldo Gautier. came from the army. He was also commander-in-chief. And as long as the army was winning, so was he. Supporting the president in the three-man ruling junta was Admiral Anaya, head of the navy. The third and junior member was Brigadier Lamy Doso, head of the air force. But in their search for ways of exploiting Argentina's strong sense of national pride, what these three men and the people who advised them misjudged so totally was the reaction there would be to their Falkland adventure in Britain. The House meets this Saturday to respond to a situation of great gravity. We are here because for the first time for many years, British sovereign territory has been invaded by a foreign power. After several days of rising tension in our relations with Argentina, that country's armed forces attacked the Falkland Islands yesterday and established military control of the islands. The government has now decided that a large task force will sail as soon as all preparations are complete. And that didn't take long.
Jodie's, a tough old warrior, followed. But despite her age and craggy appearance, she had the best communications. She would be the flagship of the most powerful fleet Britain had ever put to sea. seen the like before, and more than one came close to tears. The men in the task force had been too busy preparing for sea to think about what was happening, but it was as though those who stayed behind realized instinctively. The feeling of support back home was to remain a powerful source of comfort throughout the campaign. All the way south, what used to be routine drill became steadily more realistic. Flyco, flight control, had the task of keeping the flight deck open 24 hours a day. That's right, that's right. He, he, he had agreed. on deck, their serviceability, these three sea hands. They're all good. So you're telling me that I've got uh, nine up at the moment. Six, six airborne and three on deck. Okay. Uh, that's good. And the, uh, so the problems of this morning uh, have been rectified now. Have they? Uh, of course, the aircraft is on the roof. Yeah, well, what about that undercarriage uh, on the first launch? Okay, uh, that's good. Dawn display of the Harrier's firepower. Harrier. Rockets fired at the smoke target in the sea. just as it would the exhaust of an enemy fighter. And a cluster bomb which sprays shrapnel. Crossing the equator provided a few hours of knockabout humor. Those of us who had not crossed the line before, and a few who had, got seized and dumped. At first, we were liberally smeared with flour and water paste.
People were pulled in from all over the ship to pay homage to King Neptune. Keep your mouth shut! Kiss the right hand! Take her away! No escape was allowed. And trying was foolhardy. The concoction they tried to make everyone drink had the foulest taste imaginable. It was all intended to make you remember. On a voyage, no one was likely to forget. By the end of the first fortnight in April, Argentina's hold on the Falklands was complete. A massive airlift had brought in more than 9,000 troops and vast quantities of supplies. Planes flew the 800-mile round trip to the mainland every day, building up the garrison with more and more men and material. In a move to stop the constant flow of reinforcements, Britain announced a total exclusion zone around the islands. In effect, a blockade. Any Argentine ship, and later it applied to planes too, entering an area within 200 miles of the Falklands was likely to be attacked. For the Argentines, it meant that restocking their supplies became a hazardous business, though they did manage to get some things through right to the end. The commander of the Argentine troops on the island, also appointed governor, was 52-year-old General Mario Menendez. He had a reputation as a hard liner, and despite his outward charm, he was a tough soldier who'd made his name fighting rural guerrillas in the remote Argentine outback. Across the ocean, Ascension Island was being converted into the advanced British base from which the invasion would be launched. The task force had split in two. While the warships headed south to enforce the British blockade, the troop ships waited until they were needed. Stores from Britain were decanted through the American air base. redistribute the units and their equipment to allow for the most efficient disembarkation when the moment for invasion arrived. It also gave the troops a chance to train and relax and become less jaded with shipboard life. to think of wives back home and send some video snapshots of life on board with one of the colonels providing an introduction into this inside view of army life. This is one the married men we could muster in Charlie County cleaning their weapons after a period of weapon training. He's bashful. 
think you'll agree that uh, all of us look pretty cheerful, in spite of the fact that we're away from all you girls at home. Uh, it's difficult, I know, for you not to worry about us, but I can assure you there is no need to at all. We are well able to look after ourselves, and the newspapers generally tend to exaggerate and dramatize. Listen to the news, uh, both on the radio and television. That will give you a very accurate picture of what is happening. But don't believe half of what you read in the newspapers. This press briefing is to give you a factual military briefing of the events yesterday leading to the... Mr. Ian MacDonald, as the Ministry of Defence spokesman, became something of a national figure through his Whitehall press conferences. But away from the MOD, there was much criticism of the lack of detail and pictures from the front. A good example was the recapture of South Georgia. The Argentine Marines, who'd taken over the islands at the same time as the Falklands invasion, were pictured on television as part of coverage designed to portray the action as a military trial. Pictures showing how the British recaptured South Georgia were virtually non-existent, despite the fact that the operation was a copybook exercise with minimum casualties. A small flotilla of ships was detached from the task force as a base for the action. Then, on April the 25th, a helicopter spotted an Argentine submarine just outside Gritviken Bay. It attacked, and though the damage wasn't great, the submarine, the Santa Fe, was beached in the bay, the captain surrendered, and 156 prisoners were taken. The Ministry of Defence lost a good propaganda opportunity by not having professional cameras to cover the surrender ceremony. The only pictures of this historic event were taken by a sailor with an 8mm camera. Propaganda apart, though, the recapture of South Georgia was a great morale booster. The commander of the operation has sent the following message. Be pleased to inform Her Majesty that the White Ensign flies alongside the Union Jack in South Georgia. God save the Queen. What happens next? What's it? Thank you very much. Just rejoice at that news and congratulate our forces and the Marines. Are we going Good to declare war on the Mr. Thatcher? By now, the main task force was about to enter the exclusion zone, and the Harrier pilots were being briefed for the first airstrike. Ted, the uh, depression for CBU is worked out to what, 480 knots? 480 flap up to 450, sorry, yeah, 480 flap up to 450 mid-flap. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> It was to be an attack coordinated with a Vulcan bomber flying three and a half thousand miles from Ascension Island. The Harriers would follow it in after daybreak, and with the defences alert, they were told that three of them could expect to be shot down. By dawn, the fleet's radar had tracked the Vulcan, codenamed Black Buck, across Stanley Airfield, and monitored the code word that its bombs had been dropped. It was time for the Harriers to join the offensive to recapture the fortress. Okay, Gordon, clear on Sabre Harrier, after it's five two eight two zero five two. Close up Sabre Harrier, two three. Every plane in the task force joined the raid, 12 from Hermes, 8 more from Invincible, 20 in all. They wheeled around the sky, forming up before heading 90 miles west towards the islands. Se repite el ataque contra Puerto Argentino con mucha mayor intensidad. Antes habían sido dos aviones que habían bombardeado el aeropuerto con escasa suerte. 
Ahora el tiroteo es mucho más intenso y se ve que además otro de los blancos es el mercante argentino que está... From Port Stanley across the bay, an Argentine camera team watched the bombs falling and the fierce anti-aircraft fire. Contestan nuestras baterías antiaéreas y se ve el refugir de sus disparos en el aire. The Harriers came in low around the mountains to strike at the headland on which the airfield was built. Y ahora se hace más intenso. hadn't been declared, but that made it no less real. Out at sea, it was a tense 40 minutes before the planes returned. With everybody watching, counting, wondering if they'd all make it back safely. They did. Reconnaissance photos of the airfield showed that the Vulcan had laid a trail of bombs and got one on the runway. Other low-level pictures of the raid showed the effect of the Harrier bombs. But was it enough to close the runway and enforce the air blockade? Pictures flown out to Argentina were evidence that it was not. There was substantial damage, but enough of the runway was intact for transport planes to keep on flying. So far, most of the military activity had been confined to aerial attacks and naval bombardments on Argentine positions round the Port Stanley airstrip. But on the night of May the 2nd, an action took place that fundamentally changed the course of the conflict, put it on quite a different level. The British nuclear-powered submarine Conqueror normally patrols the waters of the North Atlantic on routine NATO business. The nearest she gets to action stations is on the various exercises against other friendly ships pretending to be the enemy. And the ship right ahead on that bearing. 355-ish. Right ahead, 355. Nothing no. else, I'll sonar to identify each target if they can. Conqueror is a hunter-killer submarine armed with the latest Tigerfish torpedoes. Since the start of the Falklands crisis, she'd been in the South Atlantic shadowing the movement of the Argentine fleet. In her sights now was Argentina's second largest ship, the cruiser General Belgrano. Two the ship was 59 miles outside the exclusion zone. One of Conqueror's torpedoes hit her amidships, and in less than an hour, she'd sunk. As the thousand-strong crew took to the lifeboats, the two escorting destroyers fled. 382 men were lost. In Buenos Aires, reaction to the sinking of the Belgrano was stunned disbelief, and a final realization that Britain really did mean business. Mr. Pym told the UN Secretary-General, Senor Perez de Cuella, that Britain wouldn't compromise until Argentina withdrew her forces. Far from doing that, though, her air force was preparing a devastating blow. On the 9 o'clock news on May the 4th, the reality of the war was brought into millions of homes by defense spokesman Ian MacDonald. In the course of its duties, within the total exclusion zone, around the Falkland Islands, HMS Sheffield, a Type 42 destroyer, was attacked and hit late this afternoon by an Argentine missile. It is feared that there have been a number of casualties, but we have no details of them yet. On 
Hermes, there was alarm and confusion. The attacking aircraft had been totally undetected until it struck. The ship swung away from the attack, and there was the crash of chaff charges being fired, throwing radar deflectors into the air to confuse incoming missiles. On the horizon, we could see smoke rising from one of the destroyers. It had been hit, but how badly? The answer was brought by one of Sheffield's officers. His ship was aflame and disabled. All power, all communication, all ability to fight the flames had been lost. They needed firefighting assistance urgently. Casualties were heavy. Twenty men had died, all within minutes of the Exocet striking and filling the ship with pungent smoke. Another score were brought to the flagship for treatment. They all survived. The rest of the crew of Sheffield stayed on board, helping with the firefighting. But Sheffield's own water mains were out of action and the ships alongside could do nothing but cool the outside of the hull. After five hours with parts of the deck white hot, the order was given to abandon ship. Sheffield continued to float while the fire burnt itself out, shrouded by the sea mists. The Navy wanted to save her, not just for pride, not just for the equipment aboard, but for the lessons they could learn about the vulnerability of ships to a modern missile. All this damage had been done by just one Exocet. One of the officers winched down to the still steaming decks to see what could be saved. Sheffield was taken in tow, but the hole was, hole was too close to the waterline. When the sea came up, she sank, taking the bodies of the dead with her. The task force had no further worries about the Argentine Navy. After the sinking of the Belgrano, the Argentine fleet stayed in or near port, neutralized by Britain's nuclear submarines. The threat remained from the air. The drifting fog banks offered little protection from radar-guided missiles, but made it hazardous for the Harriers. If they took off in this mist, their radars weren't good enough to be sure of finding the carriers again and the risks of flying turned out to be very real. The weather has again today been the dominant feature. Large, dense fog banks, solid from the surface up to about 3,000 feet, have been making life particularly dangerous for low-level flying operations. Sadly, we have learned that two sea harriers from HMS Invincible were lost during this low-level search about 80 miles west of us this morning. We have no details of the accident. We must presume the board pilots have been lost. While the task force was struggling with the bad weather in the war zone near the Falklands, at Southampton, the largest luxury liner in the world, the QE2, had been requisitioned and turned into a troop ship. On board went 3,000 men from the 5th Infantry Brigade. The 1st Battalion, the Welsh Guards, and the 2nd Battalion, the Scots Guards, were followed by men from the Gurkha Rifles. It was to make the ship a kind of divisional headquarters at sea.
departure scenes at Southampton were now becoming almost a ritual. In the previous few weeks, thousands of men had gone on board a variety of ships. None, of course, as grand as this. military approach to the crisis was strengthened, the diplomatic efforts were weakening. After a frustrating series of talks, Britain's representative of the United Nations, Sir Anthony Parsons, made what amounted to a final announcement. I also made clear to the Secretary General, as I had made clear throughout the negotiations, and as I have equally made plain to all members of the Council in informal consultations, that although my government's mind would never be closed to any avenue which promised to bring about a peaceful solution to the present crisis, we could not, in the meantime, allow ourselves to be in any way inhibited from carrying out military action in accordance with our inherent right of self-defense under Article 51 of the United Nations Charter. In effect, Sir Anthony was saying that the time for talking was over. The fighting would begin forthwith, unless Argentina started to withdraw her troops. There was absolutely no sign of that. The evidence, in fact, pointed quite the other way. The only people leaving the Falklands were the Argentines injured in the bomb attacks. More men and supplies were moving in and out of Port Stanley, despite the runway bombing and the blockade. Friday, May the 21st, the Marines on Canberra rest. They're kit-packed, ready for their task to retake the Falklands. The government had left the decision on exactly when and how it would be done to the task force commander, Rear Admiral Woodward. His troops, some of the fittest and best trained in the world, were now just hours away from the landing. The overall battle plan was simple. Split up the Argentine forces encircle the main garrison at Port Stanley and with an air, sea and land blockade force it into a bloodless surrender. That night, to keep the enemy off balance, a thousand marines and paratroopers made a series of quick strike assaults in different parts of the island. At the same time, the main force of nearly 4,000 men and 20 ships sailed into Falkland Sound. The goal was Port San Carlos, Canberra's cargo was on the move at last. Keep well clear of that ladder. The landing was the moment of greatest risk. If there were defending troops on the ground, getting ashore would be a bloody business. And for the hours or days it took to get the commando brigade established, the ships were immobile, vulnerable to air attack. For this critical moment, the transfer from sea to land, the Navy had to throw an air umbrella over San Carlos water, no matter what the cost. Without it, the whole operation would fail. There had been an elaborate attempt to confuse the Argentinians about what was going on. Raids all round the island, information leaked in London, they all pointed away from the idea of a single massive invasion. For an hour 
after dawn that Friday morning, there was peace and tranquility. The men got ashore unopposed and began digging in. It looked as though the plan was succeeding. The Falkland Islanders, stoical, undemonstrative people, greeted their liberators in a practical manner by repairing the flagpole. And a little self-consciously, a Union Jack was raised. From now on, the islanders were to find themselves spectators at a battle fought for their benefit and waged all around them. The Argentinians had taken little notice of this small settlement until now, but within two hours of dawn, they started an unrelenting air attack. Large, white and obvious made an inviting target. HMS Plymouth assigned to protect only just dodged two bombs herself. Attacking the warships, the Argentinians gave the supply ships time to unload and get the beachhead established. The first items ashore were the rapier anti-aircraft missiles. By the end of the first day they'd been set up, but they weren't yet effective. Delicate, precision equipment, it took time to settle and stabilize. Some idea of what the operator sees comes from this film of planes being shot down on the same day. It was taken through the sights of a frigate in the Falkland Sound. The attacks come at terrifying speed it needs slow motion to be sure what's happening. The ship stationed at the entrance of the bay took the worst of the assault. Bombs being lobbed, a near miss. HMS Ardent was hit. She sank. 22 men died. After that first day, the defences were reassessed. Machine guns were strapped along the ship's sides. Even jets, when they dived below the missiles, put themselves within range. The boat
Rover's guns aboard HMS Fearless claimed two planes. The gun crews, mostly 17 years old, soon had more battle experience than anyone else in the Navy. In the next major attack on the Sunday, HMS Antelope was struck. We saw a hole in each side, assumed a bomb had gone through without exploding. Many ships were having such lucky escapes. Then we realized the holes didn't match. There were two unexploded bombs on board. That evening, as a bomb disposal expert worked to clear it, one of the bombs blew up. Helicopters probe the darkness for men in the water or on the deck. We could just see some of the ship's company moving about, trapped between the cold water and the fire. Either could kill. The interference comes from the ship's radar. took hold and the ship started to blow itself up. Antelope was the same type as Ardent. Neither survived a fire following a bomb going off. We were astonished that metal ships could burn with such fury but she didn't die easily. At dawn, she was still smoldering, but mangled beyond salvation. The British commanders had seriously underestimated the Argentine Air Force, committing its planes and its pilots with an almost reckless willingness. San Carlos Bay, the helicopters ducked into the hillsides, using their color as camouflage. But this time, the main attack was against the fleet at sea. The container ship Atlantic Conveyor had joined up with the main task force before sailing on to San Carlos Bay with her cargo. Exocets launched against the carriers destroyed her instead. She'd been carrying helicopters badly needed by the landing forces. It was a serious blow. Twelve men dead. The same day, HMS Coventry, sister ship to the Sheffield, was bombed and sank within an hour. Nineteen dead. But the Argentine pilots were taking heavy losses one was shot down over Fearless, 
and ended up bobbing in the water a few hundred yards away. A landing craft was sent to pick him up. Pieces of his cockpit canopy showered down on the deck. The young gunners had their first trophy. The pilot was brought into the big dock at the back of Fearless, the ship he'd just been trying to bomb. As the medical orderlies moved in, he stopped being an enemy everyone had been trying to kill, became instead a man in pain, needing urgent treatment. The Argentine planes were still being hacked out of the sky. Watch the one in the background. One day it was our turn to be caught in a helicopter during an air raid. Two of the Skyhawks turned our way and we thought they'd attack us. But they sped by a hundred yards off, exposing us not to their guns, but our own firing at them. Dawn stand to for the British troops from the task force now well established at their beachhead on the Falklands. So far, apart from the repeated air attacks, opposition from Argentine troops had been slight. Just one or two isolated groups who'd quickly surrendered or fled. On East Falkland, the settlements at Douglas and Teal Inlet to the north were soon under British control. If Goose Green and Darwin to the south could also be secured, then the way to Port Stanley would be clear. To counter the plan, General Menendez ordered reinforcements to the garrison at Goose Green, bringing his strength there to 1,400 men. The British commander, General Moore, decided to attack. Argentine losses were heavy. Hundreds of men were killed, wounded or taken prisoner. Goose Green was the victory the British wanted. The Argentinians had been overwhelmed, not by numbers, but by courage and resolution. The British troops had, with a single action, established a reputation for winning. The proportions of the victory were ridiculous. When the confusion cleared, 250 Argentine dead had been collected from the battlefield 1,400 prisoners taken. They'd been defeated by a single battalion, 600 strong, whose casualties were 17 dead, 31 wounded. It was a battle which would never have taken place if the true odds had been known. After the fighting, the surrender negotiations went on through the night. At daybreak, the Paras took a final risk, using much of their ammunition in a demonstration of firepower, which left the peat and the gorse smouldering. The Argentinians gave in. The Paros had gambled and won, without even appreciating the odds against them. The 
field hospital back at the beachhead received the wounded. Set up in an abandoned refrigeration plant, dirty and ramshackle, it was no place to be operating. It was the best they could find. Which one do you think is the entrance wound? And entrance wound? Entrance and exit. Has he broken his femur? No. He's lucky then. As these high velocity missiles go through limbs, they create a lot of dead muscle which has to be excised because otherwise it just festers and goes gangrenous and can cause all sorts of problems. There's another Argentinian casualty with what looks like a shrapnel wound of the leg. I think he's basically very lucky. He's lucky? Yes, because from what we've seen of uh, the Argentine medical facilities, the treatment that some of our wounded casualties have had, enemy casualties, um, the treatment has been uh, inadequate to say the least. Instead of uh, removing dead muscle, they've simply closed wounds with metal clips. And this is a recipe for disaster, as any surgeon will tell you. And as you can see, the conditions are somewhat arduous. The, the light is uh, limited. We've only got a small six kilowatt generator outside. And fuel for that is in short supply. And the floors are not of uh, a standard that you would expect to see even in the grounds of a hospital back home. They're very grubby, but we're dealing with fit young men who've got good resistance to infection, and they simply need this surgery to help them survive later. There were two unexploded bombs lodged in the ceiling, but with nowhere else to go, the surgeons stayed. They kept on operating, even during the air raids. All the wounded got the same treatment, no matter their nationality. The other big problem was what to do with 1,400 unexpected prisoners. Once they'd laid down their arms, they had to be fed and housed and guarded. The British, short of men, tents and rations, were hard put to provide any of it. There were some Air Force men among them, but others, the technicians who'd be hard to replace, had been spirited away before the surrender, helicoptered by the Argentinians back to Port Stanley. To begin with, the captives were put into the sheep shearing pens and told to eat their own rations. Then as helicopters became available, they were taken back to be loaded aboard ships which would carry them home. They were mostly young conscripts, who in the main seemed pleased to be out of the war. They'd had, it seemed, a raw deal from their officers. They'd been left very much to fend for themselves. They'd been begging or stealing food from the islanders, even though there'd been plenty available from their stores. They'd also been warned that the British might shoot them. They were handed over to the military police who took charge of them. Their apprehension was obvious. In their minds, anything could happen, no matter what it says in the Geneva Convention. But they were treated precisely as the Convention dictates. they were stripped and searched, all their personal belongings except their clothes were taken away. Anything which might do harm was removed, even their bootlaces. signed the list. 
the bags of their belongings would be returned when they were repatriated. The only labels that could be found in quantity were from the Canberra. The prisoners had arrived before they were expected. It was the proper procedure, the demoralizing, dehumanizing. Goose Green were glad to see the back of them. They'd swapped one army for another, and there was no doubt which they preferred. Every soldier was a celebrity. <laughs> the surrender ceremony had taken place on the recreation ground. There had been a speech and the singing of the national anthem, greeted with little enthusiasm by the conscripts. There seemed little identity of purpose between them and their officers. When the British came to bury their dead, 11 of the 17 were officers or NCOs. The British way to take men to battle is to lead from the front. A tradition that Colonel Jones was following. He led his battalion from the front and died. Colonel may be awarded a posthumous VC for his gallantry in a military action on which the official verdict from London was of unstinting praise. The lives of the Falkland Islanders in that area are safe. 1,400 men in well-prepared positions were outfought by a magnificent battalion of some 600 parachutists. In my view, this is one of the most brilliant and courageous battalion actions which has been conducted since the end of World War II. And all of those of us in the armed forces salute to para. The graves were on a small hillock overlooking San Carlos Bay. A quiet spot set aside well before anybody had died. The flanks secure, it was time to start moving on Port Stanley. All the heavy equipment, the guns and their ammunition would need all the helicopters that were available. There was no other way to move it across ground that oozed with water. The men would have to walk. The climate was a crippling combination of cold and damp something that would test their survival training to the limit. Already some men were beginning to suffer from trench foot, a sort of mild frostbite that would take them out of action for days or weeks. The Argentinians were relying on the mountains as a barrier. They stretched the full 50 miles, high and cold, from San Carlos to Port Stanley. There were no tracks, they'd never been needed before. The Argentinians assumed that the British would not attempt to come over the top in midwinter. But they miscalculated. That was the way the Marines and the Paras chose to go. Their packs weighed 50 to 60 pounds each. Around their waist they wore a webbing belt with survival equipment and ammunition, another 30 pounds. It 
took a fit man to carry that load. They couldn't rely on getting any help. They were going to have to walk every step of the way. And sometimes there weren't even enough helicopters to get their rations to them. So at the end of the day, the campaign was to depend on one thing above all else, the ability of the Marines and the Paras to walk to the battle and still be tough enough to fight it. Ahead of us, the brigade headquarters was being set up in a barn. The maps were being marked with the dispositions of the enemy. The final plans for moving the last dozen miles to Port Stanley were being laid. The end could not be far off. The desperate need was to get men up to the front. They were being brought round by sea and slipped ashore at night. But for their equipment, ships would need to come in and anchor. The engineers were already repairing the bridge between Fitzroy and Bluff Cove. The Argentinians had blown up one end. It would have to be repaired before vehicles could move across it. But the retreating troops had only had time to destroy one pair of supports and the work was well advanced. Even the mines left in the rubble hadn't slowed things up. The brigade was sufficiently established to abandon the attempt to keeping its position secret. The Blues and Royals with their armoured vehicles patrolled forward, probing the strength of the enemy defences. Two support ships had arrived and started by unloading anti-aircraft defences, but luck went against them. The mountain mists which had obscured the Argentine observation posts cleared that day, and the Argentine Air Force, dormant for nearly ten days, struck a final blow. adequate radar, the first warning came as the plane swept low over the ships, Sir Tristram and Sir Galahad. The anti-aircraft missiles were not yet effective. Both ships were hit, Sir Galahad was immediately in flames. Two companies of the Welsh Guard were still on board. The helicopters abandoned their tasks, queued up to join the perilous rescue.
most horrifying moment of the whole war, made worse by our helplessness. There was nothing that we could do except wait with the medical teams on the cliff tops. the life raft started to drift back towards the ship. The helicopter pilots used their rotors to blow the lightweight craft to safety. Every boat and landing craft went out to help. The unanswered question was why hadn't they been used five hours earlier to get the men off as soon as they'd arrived. Apart from the 400 soldiers, each ship had a crew of 68, many of them Chinese.
50 men died, 57 were injured. It was the worst reverse of the war. And it slowed the final assault at a moment when the British were running out of time and resources. Artillery opened the battle for the mountains. The armoured vehicles were to be a distraction. While they rolled along the flat ground on the flanks, the main advance went across the top. Two para, rested after the Battle of Goose Green, were being helicoptered up to join the rest of the commando brigade.
bloodied by one battle, they were no less apprehensive about the next. But the quickest way out, perhaps at this stage, the safest way, was through Port Stanley. You're going back after a few days off. Are you glad to be going back? Yeah, I think so. I've got to get the job done. I've got to get it done fast. So the only way to do it is get in there. Do you have any feelings of apprehension, though? Oh, yes, definitely. Well, I'll shut a word out. It's just waiting around as a work part. We're all just waiting, waiting to go. So we just want to get there and get over and done with. Mm. You had one big battle already at Goose Green. You learned any lessons from that? Learned a lot of lessons. Mm. What sort of things? Well, fighting through. Just keep on going. There's no stop, no turning back. It's just straight through. No, we taught to turn back. Everything just straight through. Just keep on fighting. By Friday night, the units were in position. D-Day would be Saturday, HR, midnight, 01. The Army's alphabet demands that all advances start on HR on D-Day. The last intelligence briefings warned it would be no walkover. It's sort of there being two separate brigades. Three brigades has been reinforced, with one Welsh Guards and two Para. One WG will be in support of us, two Para in support of four Para. The timings, the exact timings are that this will start rolling at about one and this will start rolling about three. We'll start on, on board timings. A rough misty fucking runway. Some nice bombs all around it, but there are 13 aircraft, some of which are definitely Pukera, right? parked on the aprons around Stanley Airfield. There's also another report in that they have managed to reinforce themselves with helicopters from the mainland. And they've now got the capability to lift two companies for reinforcements. We know how they're going to reinforce themselves because on the slopes of Mount Kent, if you look back, they left a tented area which contained their op orders for the defence of this area. Right? And they are prepared to lose 50% of their support in troops. Right, their quick reaction force. So they're going to take this quite seriously. On Saturday morning, when it was light enough to see, the wounded, both British and Argentine, were brought back from the battlefield. The worst casualties were suffered by the Parachute Regiment's 3rd Battalion, 3 Para. They cleared Mount Longdon against considerable opposition. They lost 23 men killed, another 47 wounded, the heaviest toll of any single action. Many of the injuries were caused by mines which had been scattered from helicopters in the path of the British advance. There'd also been highly accurate fire from Argentine snipers, well equipped with night sights that let them pin down the British troops in the dark. The strength of the resistance meant General Moore's plan was falling behind schedule. On top of two sisters, the Marines too had taken their objective and were now the target for harassing fire from Argentine artillery. They should have been moving on. Instead, men coming close to the edge of their endurance had to spend another day, another night in the open, and the temperature was dropping. The delays were partly logistical, partly brought about by the time it had taken to overrun the Argentine machine gun posts, dug in with a commanding arc of fire across the mountain slopes. Last night, we came up as a company, take this position here. They removed themselves from where we initially had the contact. Was that machine gun? That was a machine gun, yes. They, they weren't there. The first troop took that, and as we came up, about 200 metres, we came under fire from up here and also further down as well. And then we simply came up as a company. And 
two troop came up here and took the SF positions, the machine gun positions, which were up here. Uh, we reckon there was about a, a company, but as we came up to them, they, they ran out, they bugged out. What um, kind of uh, what kind of weapons did they have? Is it just machine guns? GPMGs, the same machine guns that we use. Yeah. And you, FNs. You were under fire on the way uh, up, were you? Oh, yes. yes. Yeah. What kind of fight did they put up? Uh, initially, heavy fire. And then it, it appeared that as we put down our fire, and we were using the, the 66 and tank weapon, uh, they began to move, move back from there. It appeared that they, leaved, they left sort of die-hard chaps up here, um, and as we got closer to them, they also ran away. So in fact, we found no one up here at all. By the time we got here, they'd all gone. Just about five miles away, back in Port Stanley, Argentine troops at their headquarters in what was once the main school were still comparatively unperturbed by the British advance. They'd had plenty of time to build up their defences round Stanley, and although it was plain by now that the ordinary conscripts hadn't much heart for the fight, it was freely acknowledged by the British that the men manning the machine gun positions, and there were many, were extremely skillful. They were the ones who stayed on when the rest had fled. The task force commanders also felt that General Menendez had made a tactical mistake by not making more of the high ground outside the town. He tended to concentrate his troops lower down. His artillery positions were skillfully placed and the spotters guided the fire accurately. But the general consensus was that there wasn't enough of it to stop the kind of advance the British troops were engaged in, hazardous though it was. On Sunday, as the Gurkhas moved up to the top of Two Sisters, ready for the next assault, another barrage of artillery came down on us. With the high ground in British hands, the Argentine artillery had no spotters. They had to fire randomly, groping for our positions. A tense afternoon, but less deadly than the return fire. From the mountaintop, the forward air observer was directing the Harriers in bombing runs against the Argentine defenders. Roger, a bit plus of where we were aiming... His position, peering over the top of the mountain, gave us our first view of Port Stanley. A bomb gone. There's the bomb. Got it. OK, switch on. As he talked to the pilots, he guided them in with a laser indicator, which can place the bombs precisely on target. Where was that? Uh, Robert Duffel, did you see the bomb? It may have gone... Uh, oh, yes, got it. Um, just a little bit over from where I was aiming. An absolute duty, I would say. Uh, probably where there is a defensive position. Uh, what was the 1,000 pounder? Yeah. I have my number two with uh, other weapons, if you'd like him to deliver on a... It's spot on here. 
Stand by. Roger, I will do that. Is it right on? Roger, I can now confirm that the bomb actually landed on the mark. Over. We're now between the two gun lines and there's a right old artillery duel going on between them. Unfortunately, this is the area, unfortunately for us that is, this is the area where the Gurkhas are gathering and someone has clearly spotted them on the skyline. They're going to go over the top and down the other side to take the hill in front of us at dark. But we've been spotted and we've now been under fairly continuous shelling for some time. That's the British firing back. And they can't hit back at the gun which is shooting at us because we believe that's in the middle of Port Stanley, which is out of bounds as far as our gunners are concerned. So we've got a very tense afternoon while we stay here and wait to move off under cover of darkness. The battle made an eerie sight. The British progress marked only by the lines of tracer. Again, the resistance was tougher, the battle longer than expected. At dawn on Monday, the Scots Guards were still trying to fight their way to the top of Mount Tumbledown. the Argentine positions, the artillery was falling like rain, drenching the mountains in debris and smoke. Once the Scots Guards had battled their way to the top of Tumbledown, the Gurkhas prepared to move through onto Sapper Hill, the last ridge almost on the outskirts of Stanley itself. The helicopters, snuggling against the contours of the land, couldn't keep the ammunition coming fast enough. The final bombardment brought the guns down to their last half dozen shells. There was a naval bombardment too, but the task force had suffered such heavy damage that the ships couldn't provide the gunfire support that had been planned. But short of ammunition or not, the British shells kept falling remorselessly until the Argentine line broke. An Argentine cameraman showed what it looked like on the receiving end. The demoralized defenders were pulling back into the town. 
Officers and men were arguing. Discipline was breaking down. The British tactics were paying off. The appalling bombardment had been going on for weeks. The blockade, even partially enforced, had created a sense of isolation. The weather was turning nasty. There was nowhere else to retreat. The British were worried they might have to fight through the streets. Had the Argentines known that the British were on their last legs logistically, with the Navy almost unable to guarantee the supply line any longer, perhaps they would have fought on. Instead, suddenly it was all over. The guns fell silent. We are still at war with Argentina. And we'll still have cap. Normal anti-air precautions. 8-2, a roger out. Negotiations will start tonight. Although there appears to be a ceasefire at the moment and the Argentinian forces in the Falklands have appeared to have surrendered, this does not necessarily mean that the forces in the mainland Argentine will necessarily stop fighting. Therefore, we will have normal cap, that is, um, air cover, combat air patrols, and we should take the normal precautions against being caught by surprise or whatever. There is a white flag flying over Stanley. <laughs> Very marvellous. <laughs> Johar Jasli, Marty Jansa, call sign four, call objective ma, wa, pugera, di di jana. Now their major had to explain to some rather disappointed Gurkhas that their chance for fighting and regimental glory was over. The troops began the dangerous march into Stanley, weaving their way through the minefields which surrounded it. They followed carefully in the tracks of the engineers, the men who'd led every assault, showing the advanced troops the way through the minefields under fire. With the ceasefire still shaky, the order was given Advance, but fire only if fired upon. No more open fire. No more open fire. No more open fire. We beat them. The make safe weapons. Next safe. We're going to use it now. <laughs> He's not got one at the spot leg, have you? No. <laughs> Two emotions competed. Elation that it was all over, and a sense of being drained almost deprived of purpose.
so helter-skelter had been the final move forward that his troops were almost at Moody Brook, the Royal Marine barracks on the outskirts of Port Stanley, before Brigadier Thompson of the Commando Brigade caught up with them. I didn't think it would happen quite as fast as this. I expected this to be happening tomorrow and not today, but I'm delighted that it's happened today. <laughs> The real enemy defeated, there was time for some regimental rivalry. What sort of opposition was there? Running opposition. Running. They ran away. <laughs> so you just came straight in, right? right? And told to stop. That's right. We went into the town, put up the two pair of flags, the Union Jack, and then was dragged back out by the Marines. Not feeling too good about that. <laughs> what do you expect? Argentine officers were allowed to keep sidearms to emphasize their authority, perhaps even to ensure their safety against their men. That Monday evening, June the 14th, General Moore helicoptered through a snowstorm to negotiate the Argentine surrender. Not just in Port Stanley, he insisted, but everywhere on the islands. <laughs> the surrender was unconditional in everything but name, because when the agreement was drawn up, General Menendez would not have the word unconditional in the final document. In Downing Street, news of the Argentine surrender came as an enormous relief. Prime Minister, could you, uh, could you have a word with us, please? Mrs. Thatcher, just back from telling the Commons, was exuberant. And it's great Britain. Marvellous forces, every single one of them. It's just been, it's just been everyone together. And that's what matters. We knew what we had to do. We knew what we had to do. And, and, and we went about it and did it. Do you think the ceasefire will help? I believe so. I believe so. There's still one or two things. Just listen to everyone. I must go down and talk to them. As Mrs. Thatcher savoured her moment of triumph with the crowds outside number 10, her opponents in Buenos Aires were getting a very different reception. General Galtieri had intended to address the crowds from the balcony of the presidential palace. But because of the anger and stream of abuse directed at the Argentine leadership, the president took the precaution of addressing the nation from the safety of a television studio, far from the noise and violence of the scenes outside. Right to the end, the Argentine people had been led to believe they were winning. It made the shock of defeat that much less bearable. Forty-eight hours later, President Galtieri was president no more. The search for a successor was on. The uncertainties in Buenos Aires were having their effect on the Falklands. The prisoners, more than 6,000 in Stanley, several thousands more around the islands, had nowhere to live, little food to eat. The British wanted to ship them home, 
But until someone was willing to accept defeat and guarantee a safe conduct, they had to stay on the islands. The prisoners were taken out to the squalor of the airfield and left amid the mud and debris to fend for themselves. They had only a few days rations when they surrendered, just jerry-built shelter. There weren't even tents for the British. Suddenly, the danger of men dying needlessly through exposure seemed very real. It was several days before Argentina was stable enough to strike a deal to bring them home. The debris they left behind shocked a town which normally considers even blades of grass on the pavement untidy. The damage can be repaired, but it will take time and create disturbance. There will also be a considerable garrison, likely to outnumber the islanders, for many years. The mark of war will never be erased from the island's life. Despite the vigour and the confidence of the British troops, it was a close-run victory. The length of the supply line and the need to defend it strained the Navy greatly. It could have gone the other way. At the end, it was a case of whose nerve broke first. General Moore kept his and kept to himself any doubts about winning until the battle was over. One has one's moments of doubt, and I would have thought that all human beings have their moments of doubt. Uh, one has to have the strength of character to overcome these moments of doubt. What I did not ever doubt was the quality of the man. And, and that, uh, happily, I was right about. When you found it was over, that you'd won, you've obviously had a lot still to do. What was your mood? I think the, uh, my mood, uh, was a elation above everything else, that the whole thing was over. Uh, that we'd done the job we'd come here to do, that the sacrifices that had been made by a lot of young men, and as you know, in those final three days, we had 173 casualties, had all been worthwhile because the freedom of the Falkland Islanders to live the life they wanted, under the government they wanted, was restored, and that's what we come for. So it was a great sense of elation in that sense. It's been a strange sensation these past few months walking through pages of what will be history. Seeing the tragedies, being privileged to watch the heroism and the courage that war will always breed. And the principle on which it was all fought, that was best summed up by General Moore on the night he accepted the surrender of the Argentine garrison. The Falkland Islands, he said, are once again under the government desired by their inhabitants.